London. The capital city of the United Kingdom is home to approximately 8.9 million people, nearly 40% of whom were born overseas. This makes the modern metropolis one of the most diverse and multicultural cities on the planet. Although you may think this accolade is a recent result of the globally interconnected world we live in today, London has surprisingly been home to a wide array of people from both near and far for the past 2,000 years. From the Romans to the Normans, from the Stuarts to the Victorians, London's unique position throughout history has seen it become the epicenter of empires, political movements, destructive conflicts, and cultural synergies. These have layered themselves upon one another over successive centuries, shaping the modern city we know today. But how did London grow from a small provincial town into one of the largest and most renowned metropolises on the planet? This is how London became the capital city of the world. The city that would one day become the mega metropolis of London owes its existence to the arrival of the Romans in Britain almost 2,000 years ago. When the legions invaded the island in the year 43 AD, they constructed a defensive settlement on the northern side of the River Thames, naming it Londinium. Like most cities founded by the Romans, it was strategically situated at the narrowest point of the river that allowed for the construction of a bridge, thereby connecting it to the wider road and sea route networks of the empire. The initial settlement of Londinium was small and remained vulnerable to attack. Just over a decade after its founding, a massive armed rebellion, led by the Celtic Queen Boudicca against Roman rule, swept across the greater southeastern portion of the country in 60 AD, resulting in the complete destruction of Londinium, as well as the other major Roman settlements of Camulodunum and Verulamium. After the sack of the city and Queen Boudicca's subsequent defeat by the Roman legions, Londinium was gradually rebuilt as a planned town. A forum was constructed sometime in the 80s AD, and it soon boasted many other major public buildings, including the largest basilica built north of the Alps, as well as numerous temples, bathhouses, an amphitheater, as well as a large fort for the city's garrison. By the turn of the first century, Londinium was home to as many as 60,000 people and had replaced Camulodunum, modern-day Colchester, as the provincial capital of Britannia. Sometime between 190 and 225 AD, it was decided to build a defensive wall around the city to protect its inhabitants from future attacks. The London Wall would define the city's perimeter for many centuries to come, and incorporated six of the seven historical gates of the city – Ludgate, Newgate, Aldersgate, Cripplegate, Bishopsgate and Aldgate – with only Moorgate being added later in medieval times. By the 5th century, however, the Roman Empire was in rapid decline, and the year 410 marked the departure of the last Roman legion from Britain, bringing an end to nearly 400 years of Roman occupation of the island. With this withdrawal, the city of Londinium was largely abandoned by the end of the century. It was only with the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons in Britain that the city of London was given a new lease of life. Just to quickly pause for a moment, and let you know that making these videos involves a lot of work on our side, from researching, script writing and animation, to editing and final composition. Although this is very much a passion project and something we truly love doing, it can, like any kind of work or aspect of modern life, take its toll on our mental health. There have been times when the pressure of meeting deadlines, the stress of ensuring the quality of our content and the constant need to be creative have left us feeling overwhelmed and mentally drained. It's during these moments that we've realized the importance of prioritizing our mental well-being and seeking support when needed. Just like how we put in hours of effort to create the best possible content for our viewers, it's equally important to invest time and energy in taking care of our mental health. Whether it's taking breaks when needed, practicing self-care, or reaching out for professional help, we've learned that addressing our mental health is crucial for both our personal and professional lives. That's where BetterHelp, today's paid partner, comes in. BetterHelp is an online therapy platform that makes starting therapy easier and much less intimidating. With BetterHelp, 
you can have therapy sessions as a phone call, video chat, or even messaging, whatever is the most comfortable version of therapy for you. They can match you with one of over 1,000 credentialed therapists in their network based on your needs, preferences, and location, giving you access to a wider range of expertise than may be available in your city. If you feel like your therapist isn't a great fit, you can switch therapists with the click of a button in your settings at no additional cost. Join over 4 million people who've used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. Go to betterhelp.com slash thisishistory or select This Is History at sign up for a special discount of your first month of therapy. When these Germanic tribes migrated across the North Sea from what is now northern Germany and Denmark in the 5th and 6th centuries, they initially left the abandoned Roman city as it was and focused on constructing their own settlement named Ludenvik to the west of the Roman walls in the area around what is now Covent Garden. By the late 7th century, it had a population of around 10,000 people and was home to a flourishing port, as well as the first iteration of St. Paul's Cathedral, which was founded by the first post-Roman bishop of London, Melitus, in the year 604. The presence of a Christian place of worship in the city helped promote the conversion of the pagan Anglo-Saxon peoples to Christianity in the decades that followed. However, by the 9th century, the prosperous trading centre and the religious treasures housed in Ludenvik began to attract the attention of other pagan peoples from overseas, who were bent on seizing this wealth for themselves. The Viking Age in Britain began with the well-documented raid on the monastery of Lindisfarne in 793, and shortly afterwards, other treasure-laden centres of worship across the British Isles had fallen victim to their attacks. London was no exception, recording its first Viking raid in the 830s. These raids increased in number and intensity over the following years until the Vikings switched tactics from raiding to invading. In the year 871, London was occupied by the Great Heathen Army, which purportedly camped within the old Roman walls. By 886, the city had been retaken by English forces under the leadership of Alfred the Great, who ordered that the Saxon settlement of Ludenvik be moved back within the old Roman city walls. The fortifications were subsequently rebuilt, as was the bridge that crossed the River Thames, and the settlement was renamed as Lundenburg. The city's size and commercial wealth meant that it steadily grew in importance over the following centuries. Although it faced competition for political prominence from the traditional Anglo-Saxon capital of Winchester. Despite suffering further Viking attacks in the 10th and early 11th centuries, London remained intact. Upon the orders of King Edward the Confessor, it became a new centre for royal power, with the foundation of Westminster Abbey. The church was completed around 1060 and was consecrated shortly before Edward's death in January 1066. Westminster Abbey then became a focal point for royal religious ceremonies in the country, with Edward being the first of 18 monarchs to be buried within the church, and his successor, King Harold Godwinson, becoming the first of 40 kings and queens to be coronated in the same building. The year 1066, however, would mark a pivotal moment in London's history, as well as that of the wider country. The Norman conquest of England was launched by Duke William of Normandy in response to what he perceived as the wrongful succession of King Harold Godwinson to the English throne. Believing himself to be the rightful heir, William invaded England defeated Harold's Anglo-Saxon army at the Battle of Hastings, and then marched on London to have himself crowned as the new king in Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day, 1066. Under the new Norman regime, fortresses were built across the country to suppress the native population, and within London itself, several new fortifications were constructed. The most prominent of these was situated at the eastern end of the city, where an initial timber fortification was replaced with the first ever stone castle in England. From that point onwards, the Tower of London, as it became known, would be greatly expanded over the following decades and centuries, serving as a bastion of royal power that was projected across the city and country as a whole. At this point, London was by far the largest and most important city in England, though it was not yet considered to be the nation's capital. Winchester retained this honorary title, 
as most institutions associated with royal power remained situated there. It was only after a fire destroyed much of Winchester in the 11th century that the royal offices relocated to London. A further strengthening of the city's royal connections occurred in 1097, when King William II began the construction of Westminster Hall, originally intended as a residence for the king rather than as a meeting place for Parliament. London's development accelerated rapidly during the medieval period, with its population rising from 15,000 in 1100 to well over 80,000 by 1300. Aside from its predominantly native-born population, the city was home to several foreign communities, including French wine traders, Flemish textile merchants, as well as Danish and German seafarers. A sizable Jewish population also resided in the city, having settled there after their entry into the country following the Norman conquest around 1070. Most of London was still confined within the city walls at this time, though the area south of the river, known as Southwark, was also growing in importance. Passage over the river had been made possible by a wooden bridge that existed in various forms for centuries, but in 1176, the timber bridge was replaced with a more permanent stone structure. Upon its completion in 1209, the new London Bridge had a gatehouse at its southern end and was lined with houses on either side, which rose several stories high and protruded over the river. For over 600 years, it remained the only way to cross the River Thames on foot. London's development was not only marked by physical construction, but also by the establishment of its political institutions. The first recorded mayor of the city, Henry Fitzalwin, took office in 1189, and the city's right to political representation was confirmed in the Magna Carta, signed by King John in 1215. This formally declared London's unique privileges, separating it from the rule of the rest of the country and ensuring its independent governance by its own citizenry rather than by royal power. London's fierce protection of its independence was largely motivated by the valuable trade that flowed through its markets. Almost all of England's wealthy merchants lived in London, and they, along with the craftsmen who supported their businesses, organized themselves into guilds. These guilds regulated their respective trades and ensured consistent standards across various professions. The oldest of these, the Weaver's Company, was granted a royal charter in 1155, and over the years, many other guilds were incorporated, including the mercers, brewers, goldsmiths, ironmongers, butchers, and plumbers, among many others. Despite the prosperity on offer, the tightly packed, winding streets of the city were hotbeds for disease, the most destructive of which struck London in 1348. The Black Death decimated the population, and at its height killed 200 Londoners every day. The city's dense population was also prone to breakdowns in social order. There were countless riots and rebellions during the Middle Ages, but none was more prominent than the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. This saw an army of several thousand country folk march on London to protest against the exorbitant tax rates imposed upon them. The uprising led to the ransacking of the city, during which many opulent buildings were destroyed and government officials killed. Law and order was difficult to establish in medieval London. Although there were several jails in the city for imprisoning those suspected of committing crimes, there was no police force yet established to prevent crime in the first place. Instead, a system of deterrence was employed to show criminals what would happen should they be caught. Those convicted of lesser crimes might be placed in the stocks or pillories, but for those convicted of the most serious crimes and sentenced to death, they were taken to one of the city's execution grounds at Tyburn, Smithfield or Tower Hill to meet a grisly end in front of a large, jeering crowd. The dawn of the 16th century and the accession of the Tudor dynasty to the English throne marked a significant turning point in London's history, as it became one of the largest and most important cities in the world. Some of the earliest cartographic representations of London emerged during this time, illustrating the growing scale and development of the city. The Flemish artist Anton van den Wingarde produced a panoramic image of London in 1543, showing that the city had begun to expand beyond the confines of its walls, particularly westwards, 
towards the center of governmental power in Westminster. The city's population also boomed during this period, quadrupling from 50,000 in 1530 to over 200,000 by 1603. This growth was largely due to London's increasing importance as a center of commerce, which attracted people from across the country with the allure of higher wages and the potential to make a fortune. London's trading connections similarly expanded beyond its immediate neighbors in Western Europe to further afield, including Russia, America, Africa, and India. Many merchants organized themselves into trading companies, such as the Muscovy Company and the East India Company, which accelerated the adoption of capitalism and lay the groundwork for the English and later British Empire, which would spread to every corner of the globe. When Tudor Londoners were not making money, they were busy spending it in the city's numerous entertainment establishments. Inns, taverns, and brothels had existed for many centuries already, but the most defining cultural offering to emerge from this period was the theatre. Initially confined to galleried coaching inns and the houses of the upper classes, plays became so popular and successful that dedicated theatres were built. In 1574, the city banned any such establishments within its walls, prompting their construction on the outskirts. The most famous of these was the Globe in Southwark, which hosted many of the era's most influential and famous works produced by William Shakespeare. As the Tudor period gave way to that of the Stuart era, with the death of Queen Elizabeth I in 1603, London began its transition into becoming a modern city. Though this transformation was only made possible through the occurrence of several severely disruptive political and social events during the 17th century. The first of these came about in 1605, when a group of discontented English Catholics attempted to blow up King James I and his government during the state opening of Parliament on the 5th of November. Although the plot was uncovered, with the discovery of Guy Fawkes surrounded by barrels of gunpowder in the basement of the building, the subsequent trial and execution of the conspirators in Westminster set the tone for the other bloody events that were to follow. When King James I's son, Charles I, inherited the throne in 1625, he quickly alienated many members of Parliament with his increasingly autocratic rule, which eventually boiled over into a bitter civil war erupting throughout the country in 1642. London's inhabitants quickly declared themselves in favour of the parliamentarian cause and constructed a ringwork of fortifications around the city to protect it from a royalist attack. Yet within a few years, the tide had turned in Parliament's favour, and King Charles I was captured and tried for treason. On the 30th of January 1649, he was executed outside the banqueting house in London, with his head being removed with one fell swoop of the executioner's axe. In the decade following this, London remained the political centre of the country, although it was now governed as a republic until the monarchy was restored in 1660, with King Charles II being crowned inside Westminster Abbey in the following year. London nevertheless remained a dangerous and volatile place, for it was struck by plague in the year 1665, which claimed the lives of a staggering 60,000 people. To make matters worse, in the following year of 1666, a great fire swept through the city and destroyed the greater part of it confined within the old medieval walls. In the fire's aftermath, building regulations were introduced and the city was reconstructed largely in stone and brick. Much of this process was carried out under the auspices of the era's famed architect, Sir Christopher Wren, who rebuilt St. Paul's Cathedral and 52 other churches within the city as well as a monument to the fire itself, which remains standing to this day. Further construction saw the development of the West End of London, which formed the new playground for the aristocratic elite, who built mansions, theatres and coffee houses in areas like Covent Garden and St James's. This cemented the separation of the more exuberant upper-class area surrounding the Royal Court in Westminster and the middle-class mercantile city of London, which, toward the end of the 17th century, housed the headquarters of the Bank of England, the East India Company, and the insurance firm Lloyds of London, all of which played an instrumental role in supporting the international trade that flowed out of the city's expanding docklands to the east. 
with the dawning of the 18th century, London's population had swelled to half a million people. A sizable minority of these formed London's growing immigrant communities, comprising not only of other Europeans like the Irish and Jews, but also those from further afield like Africa, the Caribbean and Asia. The city's continuing expansion bore witness to some of London's most iconic landmarks coming into existence during this period. 10 Downing Street became the official residence of the Prime Minister in 1732, with Robert Walpole being the first to reside in the building, and Buckingham Palace was purchased by George III and remodelled as a royal residence in 1761. More bridges were also built over the Thames to ease the congestion on London Bridge, with Westminster Bridge opening in 1750 and Blackfriars Bridge opening in 1769. By the time the 19th century arrived, London had become the largest city in the world and was home to over 1 million people, although this would grow to 6.7 million by the end of the century. The Industrial Revolution played a large part in the expansion of the metropolis as people from the countryside flocked into the city in search of work. Many, however, would be forced into overcrowded, poverty-stricken slums, the likes of which were immortalised in Charles Dickens' novel Oliver Twist. As the city's population rose, so did its crime rate, and in 1829, the then Home Secretary and future Prime Minister Robert Peel established the Metropolitan Police, which would serve the entire urban area. Over the following decades, the force would become involved in solving some of London's most notorious crimes, such as the case of Jack the Ripper, who terrorised the East End in the late 1880s. The most transformative aspect of London during this time came with the arrival of the railways. This spurred the massive outward growth of the city, as a network of tracks connected the developing middle-class suburbs around London to the main railway termini of the city centre, such as Euston, Paddington, Waterloo, King's Cross and St Pancras, which in turn were linked by the underground tube network. In 1851, London hosted the Great Exhibition at the Crystal Palace, which showcased the technological and cultural marvels of the age. The fair was a huge success, attracting six million visitors from across the world and promoted Britain at the height of its imperial dominance. Other notable London landmarks were constructed during the 19th century, such as Trafalgar Square, Big Ben, the Houses of Parliament and Tower Bridge. However, despite the pomp and opulence that London was portraying to the world, the city itself remained a dirty and unsanitary place for most of its inhabitants. Frequent outbreaks of cholera struck during this period, and in 1858, the River Thames, which had always been used to carry away the city's sewage and industrial waste, reached breaking point and produced a smell so terrible that contemporaries described it as the Great Stink. A solution to the city's filthy problem was proposed by civil engineer Joseph Bazalgett, who organised the construction of a modern sewer system to move London's waste far downstream to the east. This brought an end to the cholera outbreaks, and his actions are thought to have saved more lives than the efforts of any other Victorian official. The city's most drastic and irreversible changes, however, would occur in the 20th century, when it was forced to face the social, economic and political fallout from two of the world's most destructive conflicts. The First World War saw London experience its first aerial bombing raids, carried out by German zeppelins and later by aeroplanes. These air raids killed around 670 people and caused great terror among London's population although a far greater impact of the war was felt in the number of Londoners who were killed in combat, with about 124,000 men never returning from the front. The Second World War, which broke out some 20 years later, wrought even more unimaginable destruction on the city. In anticipation of air raids from the German Luftwaffe, thousands of London's children were evacuated to the countryside to escape the bombing, and the citizens who remained behind in the city were forced to hide in homemade bomb shelters or underground stations. The heaviest bombing took place during the Blitz between September 1940 and May 1941, when London was subjected to 71 separate raids, with over 18,000 tonnes of high explosive being dropped. The City of London itself 
and the adjacent Docklands were the main targets of the German bombers, which destroyed many commercial, industrial and historic buildings. However, somewhat remarkably, St Paul's Cathedral survived unscathed. By the end of the war, some 30,000 Londoners had been killed by the bombing, and hundreds of thousands were made homeless. The post-war years saw London transform into the city that it is today. The overcrowded Victorian housing, much of which had been damaged during the war, was pulled down to make way for new developments. Additionally, new waves of immigrants began to arrive in the city, with many coming from the dominions of the British Empire, adding a new cosmopolitan and multicultural dynamic to the streets of the capital. The city also bore witness to a cultural revolution in the 60s, as London became the centre of a worldwide movement exemplified by the swinging 60s, made famous by the success of British musicians such as the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. As the new millennium dawned, London in the 21st century established itself as truly being one of the world's greatest and most influential cities. Almost every nationality and language is now represented within the metropolis, which is undoubtedly a direct result of the past two millennia of history, drawing people from all walks of life to its streets in search of the opportunities that can be found there. From the Romans to the Normans, and the Stuarts to the Victorians, London's unique position throughout history has arguably made it not just the capital of Britain, but perhaps even the whole world.